Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gamers Hitacom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with Intel, because there was one product that was definitely suspicious with its absence at the company's CES 2019 presentation. You want to take a few guesses? Go ahead. That's right, their graphics cards with the discrete GPUs scheduled for launch in the year 2020, assuming there are no delays. But while we certainly didn't expect a detailed product lineup with all of the teraflops and the amount of memories and all of that stuff, what we did expect, of course, is a basic synopsis of the performance targets of the GPU, possibly some ideas about the technology, which would go into the GPUs, and just some basic details. Instead, well, <laughs> yeah, no. We got no real mention of them, and most of the discussion, of course, was revolving around uh, Ice Lake and other products. But Intel have decided since then to release a few details on what they are planning with the GPUs. The long and short of it is, according to Intel themselves, the GPUs will use a similar technology to that of Generation 11. They are simply just going to scale it up for the Intel XE. Gregory Bryant announced at the JP Morgan Annual Tech Forum, which followed on from the CES conference, that I quote, the IP base that we have for Gen Graphics, that core IP base is what's been developed and built on to get the discrete graphics for both client and the data center. He also went on to continue, Gen 11 is a great step forward to us. You'll see us do it again for Gen 12 for 2020, and Gen 12 graphics in, is the basis for our discrete graphics portfolio, the Raja is architecture, architecting, excuse me, and building. Around a year ago, uh, I believe it's the start of 2018, I actually covered a topic where Intel took a Generation 9 based graphics architecture and scaled it up for a discrete prototype GPU. And Intel could do very similar with, of course, Generation 11 or Generation 12 or what have you. And it's not inconceivable for them to increase the number of execution units depending upon the target uh, performance levels that they're going for, let's say 400, 500, 600, or what have you, execution units, and create a very capable GPU. And they would couple that, of course, with dedicated memory, high bandwidth memory, or GDDR6, or whatever the standards are at that time. You can also think of it as nothing particularly different to what AMD are doing. After all, AMD have created APUs which are based on the GCN or NCU technology, which of course would be like Polaris, or that would be um, uh, Vega. And they simply have, well, exactly the same architecture, just with a few differences. For example, Vega is almost identical. In some instances, it's coupled with high bandwidth memory too with, let's say, the games consoles, their APUs are based upon different generations of GCN, depending on the games console in question. The PlayStation 4, for example, is very Polaris-like. And then, of course, that APU is then coupled with GDDR5 memory, and so on. So it means that developers and drivers are very similar and how they function. So there's nothing inherently wrong with Intel's approach, and I actually quite like it. It's going to be just really a matter of how well does it scale, what the performance is like, how do the drivers function, and what's, you know, support like from software developers. I suspect it's going to be pretty good, to be honest. And finally, what is the price performance ratio versus their competitors? Because really, that is the key. If they can compete favorably with Intel, if they can, sorry, if they can compete favorably with NVIDIA, and they can compete favorably with AMD, then we're going to have another competitor in the GPU arena, which is obviously great for us as customers. And now let's briefly discuss PCIe 4.0 and the Ryzen 3000 series processors. Lisa Su on stage actually confirmed that the Ryzen 3000 series of CPUs would indeed feature uh, PCIe 4.0 technology. In fact, we first learned that this would be the case back from a gigabyte leak uh, about a month, month and a half ago. And then I also spoke to a source who confirmed that this would be the case, and we also see USB 3.2 and other technologies as well. However, since CES 2019's conference from AMD, there have been a couple of developments. The first development is that motherboard manufacturers have provided some whispers to the industry that technically motherboards are capable of running PCIe 4.0 in the first slot. So just to clarify here, the first, the top slot, 
that is capable of PCIe 4.0. However, the other slots beneath that most likely will not be able to function at PCIe 4.0. Instead, they will remain at the standard signaling rates of PCIe 3.0 or what have you for that particular slot. That's still pretty darn good because obviously if you're just going with a single graphics card solution, not really a big deal that you only have a single PCIe slot that's 4.0. AMD's Lisa Su has then updated this. AMD have then spoken to Tom's Hardware and they have confirmed that both the 300 and 400 series boards will support PCIe 4.0 and AMD will not lock out the features. Instead, it's down to the vendor themselves, so MSI, Gigabyte, Asus or whomever to provide the support through BIOS updates for the motherboard. So that's really good news if you do have an older series board that in theory at least when it comes to PCIe 4.0, you're not going to be missing out. It remains a question though of how the remainder of the features will scale across the boards, especially if we see higher number of cores for the AM4 platform. By far one of the biggest announcements at CES 2019 was from AMD concerning the Vega 2 powered Radeon 7 GPU. For those who missed it, it's 60 compute units running at around 1800 megahertz. You have high bandwidth memory too at 16 gigabytes of memory. I'll go further into the specifications with an update in just a moment. However, there are some new performance numbers that AMD have released for this GPU. And they have provided some games uh, performance numbers with the performance uptick over the Vega 64 architecture to the website OC3D. I'll link their article in the video description. So I'm going to read out a couple of performance numbers as well as the percentage increase because I'm going to be here way too long if I go through all of this. But we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey with a 28-ish percent in performance increase. I'm assuming these are at 4K at maximum uh, quality. So 28 FPS with Vega 64 to 36 frames per to 36 frames a second. Battlefield 1 is 36% increase, so 60 FPS to 80 FPS. I'm going to round up the numbers. We have Destiny with a 27% increase, so 51 frames a second to 65 frames a second. Uh, Far Cry 5, 26% from 49 FPS to 62 FPS, and some games are considerably higher in terms of their performance uptick. We see some performance increases over 60%. For example, Fallout 76 is 68.35% with 45.5 FPS all the way up to 76.6 FPS, which is a noticeable performance increase. According to AMD, the compute performance is considerably faster when it comes to Luxmark. Uh, about 62% faster compared to the Radeon RX Vega 64. Uh, Adobe Premiere with 8K video is about 29% faster. Da Vinci color correcting is uh, uh, 1.27 times faster, also known as 27% faster. And of course, they've given more of the specifications as well. Like they've said that it's 1.8 times the gaming performance slash area, twice the memory capacity, 2.1 times the memory bandwidth, all of course compared to the RX Vega 64 GPU. And I'm also going to quickly answer another question that I got in a series of comments in the last video, and that is why have AMD gone this route? Why have they put in 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory too? Why not go with eight gigabytes of high bandwidth memory too and cut the cost of the GPU? Well, there are a couple of things. First of all, we don't know the entire product lineup of what AMD are planning. It's possible they could even release the 64 uh, CU variant of this card, or they could release a lower variant of the GPU with fewer uh, high bandwidth memory stacks enabled. But the main reason they've gone this route is actually memory bandwidth to increase the memory bandwidth, which of course was the Achilles heel of the Vega 64 and 56. And this also means that just with how the memory ties into the ROPs in the back end, that they can have more ROPs because not only was the original Vega architecture memory bandwidth limited, but it was also ROP limited. So when you have that issues with full rates, it means that when you go with higher resolutions and start applying certain visual effects, well, the performance starts to tank. How much, as you can imagine, does heavily depend upon the game and the engine itself. But in some cases, as you can see from the performance numbers that AMD are releasing here, for example, Fallout, the difference is pretty profound. Um, 
You can also see some numbers uh, regarding uh, the performance against an RTX 2080, but of course AMD might have chosen different settings, different patch versions compared to the numbers that we're displaying on screen here. Uh, and we also don't know, for example, all of the system configuration and what, you know, if everything's identical, but it gives you some indication. And of course, AMD have also released official numbers, admittedly in just a couple of games, of how the RTX 2080 does stack up against the Vega, uh, sorry, the Radeon 7. With that said, PC World have actually conducted an interview with the CEO of Nvidia, Jensen Huang. I'll link that article, of course, in the description of this video. The long and short of it is, he is not impressed with Radeon 7. Of course, he's not exactly going to be singing the card's praises, but he said, and I quote, the performance is lousy and there's nothing new. There's no ray tracing, no artificial intelligence. It's 7nm with high bandwidth memory and barely keeps up with a 2080. And if we turn on the DLSS, we'll crush it. And if we turn on ray tracing, we'll crush it. Lisa Su has actually responded to this and said, what I would say is that we're very excited about Radeon 7 and I would suggest that he probably hasn't seen it yet. There were also comments from Jensen telling us that, well, yeah, you also have the issue with AMD of we're not certain which IIBs are going to be producing the GPUs. From what we've heard so far, it's most likely the card is only going to be available at the start from the Radeon store. And then later on in the year, we're going to start to see it available at other retailers. And this actually ties in with a uh, rumor slash leak that I exclusively revealed along with the Radeon 7 itself. I heard that we would see limited quantities of the card at launch and then greater quantities of the card later on in the year. Whether this is just because AMD are trying to assess the popularity of the GPU, whether it's yield issues, whether it's something entirely different, we simply don't know, but that's how it's coming across right now. So the card, just a quick reminder, is around 700 US dollars. I say around because obviously it depends upon your particular currency. And that is roughly on par with what you can expect to pay for an RTX 2080, depending on which variant you're going for, whether an IIB is doing custom work on the GPU, obviously those can be more expensive. And there is already a lot of heated debate online of whether Radeon uh, 7 is overpriced or whether it's going to be able to compete with the RTX 2080. And I think it really depends upon a couple of factors. One, how well the card performs in independent reviews with different graphical settings with controlled in an controlled environment. Because obviously drivers can also make a large difference. It's possible, and this is just me, you know, saying this, but it's pretty obvious that AMD could release a driver a couple of weeks after launch and the performance could go up another 10%. The other thing is that it's also going to depend upon power draw, heat, and so many other factors which go into, you know, the day-to-day -day running of a GPU. Because obviously if it's really noisy, if it produces lots of heat, or if it sucks up lots of power, that is definitely a concern. And we don't know those numbers yet. Finally, <laughs> It does depend heavily on how DLSS and ray tracing along with the other technologies take off because that is really unknown right now. DLSS has some fans, it has some people who dislike it. I quite like it, but it really needs to prove itself. We've seen it implemented rather well in Final Fantasy 15, but it is the only game. We've seen ray tracing in Battlefield 5, but once again, it's not implemented even in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which was one of the first titles announced for this, and I expected that patch to have dropped by now. No. But we do know other games like Metro Exodus will support the technologies upon its launch. I guess my point being that over the next six months, it's going to be fascinating exactly what happens with the support for ray tracing technology. And this is probably one of the reasons that NVIDIA are reluctant to launch the GTX 11 series of GPUs, assuming they're real. Because if they did at this early stage, well, it's going to really hamper the adoption of ray tracing and these other technologies. But NVIDIA are very aware that the RTX series of cards has been met with some criticism, a lot of criticism, regarding the pricing. In a recent quote, Jensen Huang himself did admit that the company were too eager to put out the Turing architecture 
And in that eagerness, they probably didn't get things exactly right for the launch, which I think many of you would probably agree with. They have said that they are addressing the cheaper end of the market with RTX 2060, but it doesn't uh, certainly uh, fix all of the issues with the 2060, namely that it is still considerably more expensive than the GTX 1060. So I guess my point is that right now it's still way too early to know how Radeon 7 will stack up against the RTX 2080. And personally, I would advise the following. Buy the graphics card, which produces the best price and performance ratio for you. Don't pre-order the graphics card, whether it's AMD, Nvidia, Intel, wait for the reviews, look at a couple of different reviews for the games you play, and then make your decision. That's my personal opinion. But just to close out the video, thanks very much for watching. If you can subscribe and like this video, it helps us out a lot. So thanks for all of the support recently. It's kind of awesome, actually, uh, to have had so many new subscribers and so many positive comments. So thanks very much for everyone who's just joined us. And of course, those who have been sticking with us for months or even years. I'd also like to say that you might be wondering, why am I actually producing a video today? After all, I'm flying back to the UK, right? That's true. I actually had a few plans today with a couple of friends, but one of them had to work and another one has to attend to some personal matters. And my flight is until the evening. So I decided, well, I can either mope around the house and uh, just watch Netflix and it's raining right now, so I'm not going to start looking around and I don't kind of want to exhaust myself because the trip back is so long. So it was either like mope around the house and watch Netflix or Amazon Prime. And no, that's not me being sponsored. I'm just saying what I'd do, to be honest. Or I could produce videos and talk about tech stuff because I enjoy it. So here we are. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. See you soon. Bye for now.